And welcome everybody into the Gopher pregame show. I'm Pierre Newsham alongside Gopher Hall of Famer Ron Johnson. And the third member of our broadcast team is K-Fans Justin Gard, who joins us live from University Park, Pennsylvania. Guys, the Gophers are looking to regain some of that mojo we saw through the first four games of the season tonight. They face a tall order as they travel to take on number 16, Penn State. Ron, I'll start with you. When you've lost two in a row and then you have to go into a hostile environment like this, what is the most important thing these players need to focus on to not let the moment get too big for them? Yeah, just play their game. And, and honestly, you got to feed off each other. You got to stick to your game plan. This again, this is a one game championship season. I like how PJ Fleck puts this. A, a lot of guys would sit back and say, man, if we lose this one, we're now four and three. We lost three straight games. You can't let that doubt creep in your head. So they just have to play their game and understand this is the only game that matters, not the past two. Justin, you've been around this team a pretty healthy basis over the years for uh, for a team like this that's coming off two straight losses. But again, this is still the same team that we saw look very, very formidable in the first four weeks of the season. Which team are we getting today? Who knows? We've got plenty of time to figure it out. Good morning from a very Good sleepy morning. state college. I'm, I'm in the middle of an RV park, it seems like. I feel like I'm at an RV convention here outside of a Beaver Stadium. That is the big question is how is this team going to play? How is this team going to respond? You know, they don't look at it like we look at it, that this is a two-game losing streak, right? They basically say, as Ron said, it's a one-game championship season. All we can do is handle tonight's game. All we can do is handle the next play. So they try to look at it like that. Now, it's a lot easier said than done when you're talking about a hundred and some thousand people all wearing white all screaming all tailgating all day it's going to be a tough game tonight absolutely but um and we also don't know who's going to play quarterback for either team so there's a lot of questions on this one yeah and speaking of that last week against illinois we saw tanner morgan leave the game with what was described as an upper body injury he was taken to a local hospital after the game in his monday press conference pj flex said morgan was feeling a lot better and the signs certainly looked encouraging at least earlier in the week Fleck also said that the decision to play Tanner doesn't fully come down to him. Guys, is this a situation where perhaps Tanner sits for a game to keep him healthy for the long term? Or if he feels healthy enough and he's medically cleared, Ron, do you start him at quarterback today? So it depends on where the injury was. If it was a shoulder, if it was something like a neck, and they can say, you know what, it wasn't a concussion. It was something different like a stinger. We have no idea because college football doesn't have to disclose what happens to players when they get hurt. Some schools do more than others. Minnesota, definitely very secretive. If it was the head and he does have a head injury because of that punch, I would leave him out because you can feel great. And look what happened to Tua. He felt fine. He played, and then he got a bump. Well, not a bump. He got banged on the back of the head, and he was completely out. He doesn't even remember being carted off. So head injuries are so tough these days. It's so different than when I grew up. Uh, you know, we didn't have all the screen time and all the stimulation. It's just different. So I would leave him out if it was a head injury. I think Cole Kramer and Ethan uh, Caliamantis can get it done. Justin, uh, reports say early this morning that Tanner Morgan is going to be a game-time decision. When do you think that decision will have to eventually be made, though, as to who starts the quarterback? Yeah, I would say probably by mid-afternoon. That would be my guess. And, you know, a lot of people made, uh, you know, a, I guess, big deal that he is, of course, here with us. He was on the team playing. He did travel with the team. Chris Ottman bell also is here, right? He was also there last week. We know Chris Ottman bell is going to play. Sometimes Mo Ibrahim, they brought him along on road trips even when he wasn't playing a year ago. So I, I know they're doing everything they can to hopefully clear Tanner. But I also know he was kind of in and out of practice this week. Maybe didn't practice a lot. P.J. Fleck talked about that during the week typically you'd like a guy to be able to practice by Wednesday if they're going to be able to play in a game on Saturday he said with Tanner we might grade on a little bit of a different curve because he started almost 50 games for you but I still would be uh, very surprised um, you know if, if Tanner was was ready to go by game time but they're going to give it a shot well as much as Minnesota is a run first team they're going to have to throw it and throw it effectively in order to win this game they did not do that last week in their loss against Illinois the Gophers threw for just 38 total yards as a team that's certainly not going to get it done today, regardless of who plays quarterback for Minnesota. What are they going to have to do, Ron, in order to open things up and get better production through the air? 
Well, they're going to have to go with the easy passes first. Like you got you to gotta make the DBs think we're going to run some hitches. We're going to run some slants. I'm saying it, it's probably not going to happen. The old slant offense with Rashad Bateman, uh, Chris Altman Bell leaving, I don't see it. We haven't seen it where the RPO slant is a big play. RPO slant and go. But you have to run some short stuff. Everything can't be this right there. Everything can't be a go. Everything can't be a takeoff. You're not going to get a bunch of big plays on Penn State. They've got to like, take what the defense gives you like in the running game do the same in the passing game you have a six seven 270 pound tight end we'll look at him later in the telestrator but he is a weapon use him in the short game they've got to be able to do that and then when you see it take the top off justin ethan kelly manis uh cole kramer we've seen both of these players in action if one of them is called upon to start in today's game what do you expect this go for offense to look like with either of those two under center well, I think with Ethan, you know, they have the ability to push the ball down the field a little bit further. At least that is in his skill set. He's got a very live arm. You know, Kirk Shiraka talked about this week, recruiting him since he was basically a sophomore and saying, if we ever want to have a big time talent at this position, this is the investment, the time investment that we have to make. So that's what they think of him internally. If in fact, he does have to play tonight. Cole Kramer, probably a little bit different, right? He's more of a wildcat guy. He's probably more of the Tanner Morgan type. So there are different skill sets there for either one of those guys. And depending on who gets the nod tonight of all three of them, things can look a little bit differently. But it also is all going to start with Mo Ibrahim, right? I mean, just 15 carries last week, not necessarily ideal. They want to get him probably in that 25-30 rep range if they're going to have a chance to win tonight. Justin Gard, a true showman, talking about Mo Ibrahim. As we lead into talking about Mo Ibrahim, being just a machine this season, the senior back is averaging nearly seven yards a carry and has scored nine touchdowns on the year. Guys, Penn State obviously knows that Tanner Morgan, if he plays, he's not going to be at 100%. How much more do you believe they'll sell out to stop the run later tonight, Justin? Oh, they will. There's no question, especially because Michigan ran for over 400 yards against them a week ago with a million explosive plays. That was the talk here in Happy Valley is what's going on with the defense, what's going on with the run defense. Michigan really controlled that game. Uh, Penn State got a pick six in the first half that kind of kept them in it. But so they, they know that they have to stop the run regardless of opponent. But they certainly know with Mo Ibrahim in Minnesota and P.J. Fleck and how they want to run things that that's got to be 1A, 1B, and 1C for them. So then you ask the question, guys, is it an opportunity to do what we've seen before this season is throw the ball early, throw the ball on first down, throw the ball when they're in a run defense, so to speak, and try to get ahead of the chains that way. But yeah, Mo Ibrahim is not sneaking up on anybody, that's for sure. Gophers hoping to have Trey Potts back as well, Ron. Yeah, and, and you look at that, these are two different backs. Trey Potts just give you a little bit more pop and flash. But again, it's going to be a take what the defense gives you. And Justin's dead on. With Mo, they're going to sell out. They're going to put a bunch in the box. With Trey, they're going to put a bunch in the box. So it's got to be some strategic runs, too. Like if you know the box is packed, run a, a toss flip where there's a crack from the outside you seal with an outside guy and you leave your running back one-on-one -on -one with either a nickel or a cornerback that's a running back's dream to have a corner or a nickel trying to tackle him versus a linebacker you'll see here one cut these dbs are not built They're, they don't practice trying to tackle every day that's not their thing their thing is covering so when they have to get put into some of those situations they take bad angles i think that's the way to do it you got to get on the outside you got to get on the edges because penn state's going to load that middle box well earlier this week on the pj flex show we asked him if a night game under the lights has a different feel to it and he didn't deny that there's a little extra juice when you play under the lights on a Saturday night Ron you have played in big games before do the guys get hyped a little bit more for a night game in an atmosphere like this oh yeah and you know the lights are out so if this was me I'm putting on a Vaseline I'm getting my arms ready I'm getting <laughs> ready to go out there like the lights are gonna be shining you got to look good for TV but yeah I mean the, the biggest thing is you this is the fun time when you know it's you and your teammates versus the world because everybody in that stadium besides your little small group of fans I think it was like 10,000 just I'm not sure who came down but when you look at that hundred thousand fans screaming at you that's the fuel you build off of when you know they're quiet I had Glenn Mason on my show this week and he talked about being in Penn State when he was there in 99 and he said and Ohio State and he said that he said if the fans are quiet we're doing good if they're booing we're doing great he said a player came up to him and said coach I think we're doing awesome he said what do you mean he said everybody's leaving and so when you can control the crowd <laughs> like that that's when you know you're having fun and so again these moments are what athletes dream of when you're a kid you dream of going to somebody else's stadium and playing and shutting the crowd up and so these kids are ready for this Justin you're in Happy Valley did your Vaseline make it through the TSA <laughs> 
Well, that's exactly where I was going next, Pierre. Congratulations. You've now crossed. It's a rite of passage on the Gopher pregame show. You know it's a big game when Ron starts talking about the Vaseline. And uh, so here we are, October 22nd. We've got our first Vaseline game. I will tell you, though, you know, obviously you see the stadium behind me. It's massive. It's huge. Uh, we kind of broke character in the traveling party last night where more often than not you get plain tarmac hotel meetings only a couple of times in my 12 years have we actually gone to the stadium on friday night and the gophers did that last night and i, I didn't ask pj about this but i imagine it was he didn't want some of these guys who haven't you know have never played here this is only my second time here in 12 years to have the stadium behind us their first look be when they get here today so they spent 10 15 minutes just walking around you can't walk on the field until game day because it's natural grass they take a lot of pride on it but just walking around the perimeter taking in the sights and sounds and everything that comes with it they did that last night i think maybe to just give people a first look at what they're dealing with today well kickoff is scheduled for 6 30 later on tonight in happy valley and we have more to come here on the go for pregame show when we come back we'll take a look across the field and discuss what makes this penn state team so tough to play against that's next You're watching the Gopher Pregame Show. 
Welcome back, everybody, to the Gopher pregame show. Getting you ready for kickoff here between the Gophers and the Nittany Lions. Guys, let's talk about this Penn State offense. So much of what they like to do is run the ball and run it at you as many times as possible. They've got a great one-two punch at running back with Nicholas Singleton and Katron Allen. Illinois racked up over 200 yards on the ground last week against Minnesota. Ron, what does Minnesota need to do today in order to prevent a similar fate? Well, you look at their Gophers defense right now, they're six in the Big Ten, 104 yards on the ground per game. The biggest thing I notice when they're doing well, the linebackers are anticipating. They're not guessing. They're anticipating. They're reading their keys. I think that's going to be the key for that. You have to be able to cut off and not allow the additional movement, the additional like cuts. You saw what, what uh, Illinois did. They got to that second level, and guys were guessing and trying to figure out which way is this running back going. We know there's a good running back. These two for Penn State are good, but if you hit them early and you force the quarterback, because the quarterback hasn't had a great year so far. Like, Sean Clifford has not had a great year. I think last time he's in Minnesota, he made some comments about they're here to see us. So they're not here to see you, buddy. They're here to see the Gophers when they're here. Now when they come back to Penn State, now it's your turn. But if you can force them to throw on third and long, I think they have this game. Justin, it was a bit of an anomaly last week, considering with the way the season has gone for this Gopher run defense. I mean, they're going to have to get back on track today. Well, Illinois just completely shrunk the game. I mean, when you think about the Gophers scored their first touchdown of the game with eight minutes and 30 seconds left in the first half and then really didn't get the ball back, right, until I think a kneel down with 20 seconds left. Illinois just completely took the Gophers' offense off the field. Drives of 20 plays, 17 plays, uh, unbelievable time of possession, 40 minutes. The Gophers have to get off the field. Ron nailed it with guys guessing a little bit last week. I thought Illinois did a great job of keeping the Gophers off balance. That started with Chase Brown, who's an absolute stud, but also a good quarterback play from Tommy DeVito. So the Gophers were guessing a lot last week, had their eyes in the wrong spot. That's what led to the long touchdown on the first drive. That's what led to the easy walk-in touchdown for DeVito, but they just have to find a way to get off the field tonight. They can't allow Penn State to do, to do what Illinois did and just have these long time-consuming drives keeping the defense out there. That's got to be the biggest key is just get off the field somehow, some way, however you do it. You can't see it, Justin, but I have a tear in my eye. I mean, the fact that you said <laughs> I got that right, like, I have a tear <laughs> in my eye. I uh, thought that was Vaseline. I, I thought that was just vas ex extra Vaseline. The Vaseline is only for cold weather Hard and fights. Tell. That's what my grandma told me. Hard to tell at this Cold point. weather and fights. That's it. <laughs> guys, we like to joke that it feels like Tanner Morgan has been in the University of Minnesota forever. But in a funny way, I feel a similar way about Sean Clifford and Penn State. Clifford left last week's game in Michigan with an injury. He didn't put up great numbers in that game. And some are already calling for freshman Drew Aller to take over as the starter at quarterback. However, head coach James Franklin didn't give much indication that he would be making a change at signal caller at uh, for Penn State. Guys, should Penn State stick with Clifford at quarterback? Justin, I'll start with you. Yeah, you're right, James Franklin. It's a, it's a very similar situation to what Minnesota is dealing with. And Pierre, I wouldn't say some want to change at quarterback. My indications here are a lot of people want a change at quarterback. And it makes sense, right? Clifford has been here for a while. This would be his 40th start if he plays tonight. We'll see how the shoulder is 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 holding up. But everybody loves the shiny new toy. You know, we mentioned Ethan's a four-star recruit for the Gophers. Drew Alar is a five-star recruit, depending on who you ask, was the best quarterback in last year's class, the second best or the third best. Point is, he's really good and he's really talented. But James Franklin, like P.J. Fleck, like Kirk Ferentz, like Paul Chris, before he got fired, they're very loyal to the leadership part of the deal. Sean Clifford's been through a lot with this program. Ron mentioned it. He was at this game in 2019, had a really good September, but has come back to the pack here a little bit in October and has not played well. So I expect that Clifford will play if he's healthy enough. I don't think they're going to make a change just because a lot of people are being loud about it here in Happy Valley. Ron? I was hoping they were going to play Chad Powers. Like, I don't know if anybody's seen <laughs> Chad Powers on campus, but I was hoping they would play Chad Powers because Chad Powers can spin that ball. That's Eli Manning for the people at home. Like, who's Chad Powers? <laughs> Eli Manning dressed yep. up working out. But yep. Google it. Google, Google it. it. Yeah, I had to Google it real quick to remember his name. But if you think about it, uh, I agree with JG on that one. Like, everybody loves the shiny new toy. Everybody second guesses the guy that's been there getting them to the end. Everybody's guess second guessing the guy that can win them games. Sean Clifford's not doing great. 59% completions. That's not great, but he's only thrown two touchdowns. I truly believe if he had thrown as many touchdowns as Tanner Mor or interceptions, sorry, as Tanner Morgan, they probably would look at a freshman, but he's only thrown two. Like, he, he hasn't been great in the 59% or uh, completion percentage is not great, but he has gotten it done. So I want them to play whoever is going to mess up the most tonight. Like, whoever's going to mess up the most, <laughs> just put them in the game.
When you've dropped two games in a row and you've only averaged 12 points over those last two games, Ron, what are some of the small things you can do as an offense to find a spark and gain confidence early in this game? I keep saying the short game. Like, three-step drop is the easiest thing. One, it's easy on offensive linemen. It's easy on your tackles. They're not blocking for five, four seconds, five seconds. It's a quick one, two, three, boom, out. It's a quick one tunnel screen, out. Like that right there, you know, quick RPO stuff so Tanner can figure it out quick if it's not there or whoever, if it's Cole Kramer, Ethan, they can figure it out quick and they get going. You can simplify the offense without having them to worry about a second or third read. In the quick game, there's only two reads. You're either going right or left. That's it. You're not going to look. You can't scan. Your last read is drop it off to your running back or run the ball. So I'd say keep it simple, stupid. Like you have to do that in a game like this with a team that's good. Justin, you've been around P.J. Fleck a long time. I'm going to ask you to get in his brain a little bit. What are you doing to try to cause a spark for your team early in this game? Well, you know, it's yeah. who knows, like Glenn Mason, to Ron's point, you brought him up uh, earlier in the show, Glenn Mason started the game with an onside kick here. I don't expect P.J. to do that. But on the <laughs> passing game in general, like I want to I want to see which receiving option is going to step up. You know, I think the, the most damaging stat for the Gophers this past week, according to Pro Football Focus, that our guy Ryan Burns had, it's a great stat, not if you're a Gopher fan, but it's instructive of how the passing game has struggled. The Gophers in the last two weeks are one for 11. When there's a contested catch, a Ron Johnson-like catch, that you absolutely have to make, Vaseline or not. you got to come down with the ball. The Gophers have caught one of those 11 contested catches. You go back to Michigan State, it seemed like they made every contested catch. So who's it going to be? Is it going to be Michael Brown-Stevens? Is it going to be Brevin Spanford? Daniel Jackson was pretty much a race last week by a good Illinois secondary. Like it, it, We talk a lot about Tanner with good reason. He's the quarterback, but the receivers, they, they got to have themselves a day here because this is a physical secondary. You're not going to get a lot of calls. You can't play for PI. You just got to go make some catches. Yeah, and, and the thing about P.J. said on the P.J. Flex show, receivers are not attacking the ball. Chris Altman-Bell had the most violent hands, he would say, out there. Rashad Bateman when he got the ball. Tyler Johnson went. These young receivers, Michael Brown, Stevens for sure, go high point and attack the ball. Don't fall back thinking it's going to come to you. You have to go attack the ball. Get violent today. Get excited. It's yours. All right, guys, stick around. When we come back, Ron and I are going to break down some plays, some of the key plays from Minnesota's game against Illinois last week and where they can improve.
Welcome back to the Gopher pregame show. Welcome back, everybody. You're looking at a live picture right now outside Beaver Stadium in Happy Valley as we get set for kickoff later this evening between Minnesota and Penn State. Time now to break down some of the things that stood out to us from the loss last week against Illinois. Ron, let's start in the backfield here. Uh, Mo Ibrahim ripping off a big run. What do you like here? So what you're basically going to see here is these guys are accounted for these guys. So he knows the count. If you look at the DBs, you're counting here. How many guys can affect you in the box? This is the guy. So if Mo cuts back, what you're going to see, he's going to press and he's going to cut it all the way back. This guy is going to be accounted for this guy and you're going to see a backside block. That's going to be the key. It's the backside blocks. You'll see the tackle get around. Now watch him turn the hook. There's the tight end hooks. Boom. And Mo's out the gate. And like I talked about earlier, DBs do not want to handle running backs of this caliber. That's not what they want to get paid for. They want to get paid for stopping guys. The next play is a pass play. You'll see it here. I'm pressing the edge. But the next play is the pass play that, that I'm excited about. When you're thinking about um, it's simple, easy. There's nobody up here. So there's three receivers down here. They're telling him exactly what the play is. If you think about where the play goes and what they're doing, you're going to have a simple post over here. You're going to have a deep out, and you're going to have a whip route. That's his two. That's his look, high to low. He's looking at the whip when you play it here. Tanner's very decisive. He doesn't like the whip. He sees a 6'7", 270-pound tight end over the top. He gets the pass interference. But look at that height and difference in matchup. Tanner Morgan sees it throws it high. The next one is just an Ohio. I mean, look at that. That's beautiful. Yeah. And the next one is just Illinois. This right here, the safety has to be able to disguise a little bit better. You're telling me right now and you're way too far off the hash. I'd rather him here and him here come up late and then get over to where you got to get to. They're not doing that. So what are you doing? You're telling the quarterback right now in this RPO. You guys are bracketing in the top. I got one on one covers down here. You're done. We're even, we're leaving, and that's what receivers dream of. You give me one-on-one, -on -one and you make it easy for the quarterback to see it. You see it right there. It's press yeah. coverage. You have to be able to stop that, and the Gophers did not do it. It was kind of a weird coverage there. you got to disguise so the quarterback can't figure it out too early. He knew right away where he was going with the ball. Hopefully we see a little bit better defense today from the Minnesota squad, and more coming up on the Gopher pregame show when we come back. Our one-on-one -on -one conversation with tight end Nick Callerup and how he was almost a long snapper instead of a tight end. That's next. Hey, don't downplay the uh, long snapper. Derek Rackley, tight end for the Gophers. You know it. Went to the NFL for that. <laughs> Mason brought him back.
1955. You're watching the Gopher Pregame Show. Welcome back into the Gopher Pregame Show, everybody. Special guest joining us now, one of the tight ends on this team. It's Nick Callerum. Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's been uh, a good season for you guys so far, but the last couple weeks you haven't gone your way. When your team uh, you know, loses back-to-back games, what's the message among the players and the coaching staff as you head into a new week and a new opponent? I think it's believing that we're still a good team, and that we just didn't play connected into our potential that specific week yeah yeah no doubt when you have a team like Penn State coming up uh, obviously a team that has a lot of history and a lot of tradition you guys go in a happy valley what are some of the things you guys have talked about in terms of being ready for the atmosphere and your opponent well Fleck likes to keep it loud at practice so there's that but um, we kind of approach it the same way every week is we kind of approach it the same we don't try to make them this big giant you know kind of approach it the same way every week sure and uh, they're beatable yeah, no doubt about it. When you look at your career here at the University of Minnesota, from what I understand, you were originally going to be a long snapper at another school, but that changed. Am I correct in that? Well, in high school, I I tried to be a long snapper. Um, I went to all the specialist camps and all that, and um, and then I played offensive tackle um, my junior year. And then uh, like a week before the season, they moved me to back to tight end senior year, and then I was the backup. Our starter got hurt in the first like the first quarter of the game and then I stepped in and had a pretty good season and ended up walking on here. Did you did you, you mentioned you go to the specialist camps did you ever think that tight end was going to be your position moving into the collegiate level? Not until the summer before senior year when um, I got some some like D2 offers to play tight end even back when I was still a tackle. Sure. I was like, okay maybe this is something I could do. So I, t- I talked to my coach and uh, he was able to move me back uh, for the senior year, yeah. You mentioned you had D2 offers, but how did you end up here at the University of Minnesota? Uh, well, I kind of was the backup. We did a lot of two tight ends, or we were planning on it, and then um, my friend Billy, he was the starter. He went down, and um, and then I just kind of emerged as the kind of the number one target of that offense, and we had a pretty good quarterback. Keaton Heidi went to South Dakota. He was very good, and he got me the ball a lot, and um, I put up decent enough numbers to catch some attention to get up here and you you and I have talked off camera a little bit you're from YZ so you get a yeah. chance to stay home your yeah. family friends get a chance to see I'm sure they had to play a big role in you choosing the U yeah it was huge um family's really important to me and, and being close to my mom and my brother and sister back home like if I wanted to I could hop out hop in my car get down there in 20 minutes sure go have dinner and come back and yeah you know. who doesn't love to have dinner in YZ it's a great town <laughs> yeah what did you love growing up the most about in YZ um I didn't have a boat, but my friend had a boat, and we'd always go on out on uh, Minnetonka. It's, al- it's always better to have the friend with the boat. Yeah. That way, you <laughs> yeah. know, you're not in charge of cleaning the boat and like doing. All- it's always better to have the friend who has the boat. I would think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would. I would agree with that. I, mean, I need to get me a couple of those friends who have a boat. Uh, Coke Keefe was here last year, you know, and he's having a, a good start to his NFL career down in Tampa. How much do you keep in contact with him, and how much of an impact was he for you when during his time here? He was huge. He was kind of my role model coming in here. I had him with the COVID year. I was able to. He was able to stick around, so I had him for an extra year. Um, and he was a huge impact on just the way I play the game. And um, and yeah, like you said, I, I talk to him every once in a while. He's loving it down there. How so? How how was he? Is such a, you mentioned he had a, a big impact on you. How so? Kind of the mentality that that you have to have to play tight end here is kind of like like I mentioned earlier. You got to have a little hate in your heart to play, not towards anyone in particular, sure. but. You gotta be a little angry, a little violent to play this position. Did he have so much of an impact that you also have a red beard going <laughs> right now? Like that, I know there's a there's a similar theme happening here in this tight end room here. Yeah, I, I couldn't grow I couldn't grow a beard until I got to college, and, and once it started coming out, I was oh, it's red. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. <laughs> How much farther do you think that beard's gonna go out? Uh, it's going through the season. So, okay. So we'll see. Uh, you mentioned Fleck keeps it pretty loud in here. He had spoken to us earlier in the week about how he's trying to simulate the atmosphere in Happy Valley as best he can with distractions. Does that help during practice? Do you find when you've played in a game or practiced leading up to a game similar type atmosphere, do those things help during practice once you step on the field on Saturday? It definitely can, especially with um, like the communication from the quarterback to the O-line and, and to us kind of telling us the plays like he's got to be loud and um, like going on the clap instead of the cadence. 
um, it definitely helps, yeah. Sure. If Tanner Morgan can't play this Saturday, talk a little bit about the confidence that you guys have in both Cole and Ethan. You obviously see what they can do in practice every day. If Tanner can't play, uh, you know, how much confidence do you have in those two guys? Uh, we have a lot. I mean, uh, I, I grew up playing against Cole for three years, and right. now we're playing together. So I know what he can do. He's great. And uh, and Ethan, Ethan's, uh, he's, he's really athletic. He can run around. He can throw it from different angles. And, uh, I mean, yeah, we, we got full confidence in these, these two that they can get it done. Well, there you have it from Nick Callerup. Uh, like we mentioned, him and Kokia, there seems to be a, a running trend in that tight end room of a red beard. I don't know how long that trend is going to continue, but it seems to be working for them. I mean, he caught a touchdown against Michigan State. Uh, the tight end room, a lot of talent in that room. Yeah, and, and if they're going to run the ball, they're going to need him to be able to help out and block. No and doubt. Be another body on the end of that line. But also, Derek Rackley played when I played and was a tight end long snapper. Ended up going to the NFL for long snapping. So, I would tell Nick, don't give it up just yet. Yeah. You know, keep working at it. You never know. A team might draft or want to talk to you to bring you into camp. And you're like, hey, I can be your backup long snapper. You never know what might happen. It's a fine, fine art long snapping is. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I know we know a guy by the name of Mike Morris who would also tell us otherwise. I mean, he's, he's very fond of long snapping as well. All right, when we return on the Gopher pregame show, we'll take a look around the Big Ten. We'll discuss some of the big games happening later this afternoon. That's coming up next. It's flexible and it works. Welcome back to the Gopher Pregame Show. Thanks for staying with us here on the Gopher Pregame Show. Time now to take a look around the Big Ten this weekend. Guys, let's start with a game you can watch right here on Fox 9. Number two, Ohio State at home. 
welcoming Iowa. The Hawkeyes have lost two straight, and they've also scored a combined 20 points in those two games. Ron, Iowa is going to have to play a near-perfect game if they want a chance to win this game. They have no chance of winning this game. I feel like <laughs> I'm watching like Rocky and his corner manager is going to be over there, throw in the towel! <laughs> like, it's going to get bad. I cannot wait. I am going to have my popcorn ready. My Twitter is going to be going because every single chance I get, I'm tweeting some hate towards Iowa fans. Justin, I think, I think Ron thinks that uh, Ohio State is going to win this game. What about you? Yeah, I think he's leaning Buckeyes there. I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a beautiful Saturday t hate tweeting Iowa, Ron. I think there's better things you can do with your time. I will say my favorite nugget about this game is Iowa is almost a 30-point underdog, wow. having not allowed anywhere close to 30 points defensively all year. So that just tells you uh, what Vegas thinks of this game. But yeah, it's it's Ohio State. They they should have no trouble with Iowa. And as we know, Vegas is almost always right. Let's move over to another Big Ten matchup taking place today. Two teams heading in the wrong direction. Indiana travels to take on Rutgers. The Hoosiers started the season 3-0. They have since lost four straight. Rutgers, meanwhile, they too began the year a perfect 3-0. And since then, they've lost Three straight. Someone's streak is going to be coming to an end. Justin, who do you think it'll be? Man, I have no idea. This is a tough <laughs> one. This is a very, very. You just think about what's going to happen behind me tonight. 109,000. Great vibe. Unbelievable deal. Then think about the inverse of that. I'm, you know, I'm going to go with Indiana. I'm going to go with Indiana. I'm going to go with Tom Allen. He's going to rally the troops, to use that cliche, and uh, somehow sneak by Rutgers. But I feel like it's going to be like 12-9. That's going to be the oh. final. Sounds like a, a very, very beautiful game. If you have a coin, Ron, I would imagine you'd probably flip it at this point between these two teams. Yeah, because you look at both their quarterbacks. You got Evan Simon and then you got Connor uh, Blazelak. They're both at the bottom of the barrel for the yeah. Big Ten quarterback play. They do have a good receiver in Indiana and Cam Camper. So I'm going to go to Indiana because of that. I think like whoever has the best day passing is probably going to win this game. I don't think it's going to be a running game. Uh, it, it, Indiana has not looked bad. Like They've actually looked pretty explosive at times. And so I just think they have a little bit more firepower. And, and I agree with, with um, JG on that one. 12 9, you heard it here first. Final score in <laughs> Indiana and Rutgers. Interesting matchup here, guys. We're halfway through the college football season. And I can't recall a time when Wisconsin was in dead last in the Big Ten West as late in the year. Ron loves that. Uh, that's where you can find them, and they're hoping to turn things around against Purdue squad. That's won four in a row. Uh, Purdue, uh, we, we saw them here. A few weeks ago, Ron, I was certainly looking formidable. Purdue, Wisconsin, what do we like here? Purdue is good. I mean, Purdue's a good team. They, they do a lot offensively. They got Aiden O'Connell, one of the best quarterbacks in the Big Ten. I know that they are going – well, you know what, and, and, and again, I'm going to say this about Wisconsin, their run game. But we cannot deny that Braylon Allen is one of the best running backs in the country. So it's going to be one of those games where if they can stop the run, it's Purdue's game for the taking. But if Wisconsin pulls out a Wisconsin type of day, different voice now, Paul Chris gone. Who knows? They might actually be Purdue. Justin, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't have a video monitor in front of you, and, and because of that, you didn't see Ron fist-pumping with enthusiasm at the fact that Wisconsin is in dead last in the Big Ten West. Is yeah. there a chance they get back into the mix with a win today against Purdue? I, I don't think so. I didn't see the fist pump, but I felt the fist pump yes. from all the way here in the middle of Pennsylvania. I felt it through the, the through the glass here. <laughs> I agree. I think this is Purdue. You know, if Braylon Allen goes for 250 yards, I think they can win. But other than that, no. And Purdue, like Illinois, I mean, those are the two teams in the Big Ten West right now. I think it's all pointing to that mid-November date in Champaign, Purdue and Illinois. That's your Big Ten West championship game. I think Purdue knows that, and I think they keep pace with the Illini today. I would have did the gritty if I could. If I could, if there was a gritty cam. There's still said, time. When he says, hey, Wisconsin's the worst, I would have gritty it out. I mean, there's still time. I think we're still running. Uh, I think we've got a couple minutes to kill, so who knows? Maybe we'll see a gritty from Ron Johnson before the show is over. But before we get to that, we need to get to one more matchup. Maryland has had a nice season thus far, but they may be without their starting quarterback today. Talia Tagovailoa is a game-time decision for the Terps due to a right knee injury. Billy Edwards Jr. saw some playing time last week when Tagovailoa left the game. Ron, Maryland is 5-2 and two this year. Can they win even if Tagovailoa doesn't play? No, if Tagovailoa doesn't play, he's a game changer. He's a difference maker. Uh, I just don't think, and again, Northwestern's nothing flashy. Like, they're not great either. But I just feel like Talia is a difference maker when you see him do things like that, step yeah. up in the pocket and just unleash a big throw. When you, and, and again, you don't know what the backup's going to give you, but he's not going to give you that. And so there's a reason he's a backup right now, at least. He's young. And so Talia Tagovailoa is the guy. If he doesn't go, I think it's going to be a tough game for them. 
And just Maryland is still in the mix here. I mean, they've, like I said, they've had a pretty yeah. solid season. I mean, coming up against Northwestern, uh, they're favored to win this game. I, uh, I would imagine. I didn't check the line, but I would imagine Maryland's favored to win this game. But yeah, and I would. Uh, reg- I think if I was playing quarterback today for Maryland, I think we could still hang with Northwestern. <laughs> I mean, Northwestern is. They are. They are struggling. They are battling. They are not playing very well. I mean, Wisconsin boat raced them a couple of weeks ago. It's been pretty remarkable to see the drop in Northwestern, given that they just won the West a couple of years ago and have won it twice in the last five years. But I go with Maryland no matter who the quarterback is and if Talia is playing, absolutely Maryland. Justin, I got to tell you, looking, looking behind you, I know we don't have any music bumping uh, like we did last week, but it looks like a beautiful day out at University Park, Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's nice to be able to hear you guys. It's nice to be able to not have to comment on every song on, on Ron's iHeartRadio playlist that was that was bopping around last week in Champaign. You know, we, we could barely hear anything going on. This is great. It's peaceful. We've got cars pulling in and out all the various lots. RVs have been here for seems like months. It's wonderful. It's I, I, absolutely wonderful. How late, how late did you stay up listening to the new Taylor Swift album, though? I'm glad to see you made it on time. <laughs> uh, if you never went to bed... Is it even count as staying up late? It's a fair point. We should ask Lori Fisher that. I'm sure she probably did the very thing. <laughs> Light a candle. Yeah, a lot of us did. And listen to Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good songs. And I'm the problem. That's the one I've seen. I am the problem. Well, oh, you know, I, not, in my heart, you're not. But, you know, that could, that could be, you know, up for debate for, for some of us else. Shake it off. That's yeah. my only Taylor Swift song. <laughs> there, you have, there you have it. We're not done here on the Gopher pregame show. When we come back, we'll give you our keys to victory as we get you ready for Minnesota. Start a new Chevy truck with accessories. You're watching the Gopher pregame show. Winding things down here on the Gopher pregame show. Time now to get to our keys to victory. And because Justin's on the road, we will start with him. Justin, uh, your key to victory today, sir. 
they have to find a way to get back to their game offensively. The last two weeks for the offense, not ideal, right? Couldn't do much against Purdue, could do even less against Illinois. They have to find a way to – what does get back to their game mean? It means they have to do to, to Penn State what Illinois did to them. They've got to stay on the field. They've got to sustain drives. They've got to stay ahead of the chains. They've got to keep Penn State off balance. They've got to do all of those things. When they get one-dimensional and they don't run the ball very well, Penn State can just pin their ears back and blitz, which they like to do anyway. That's when things go poorly, right? And so they have to just find a way, especially early when this place is going to be on fire. There's going to be 110,000 people all wearing the same thing, towels everywhere, music loud, lions roars, the whole bit. Just get through that initial 10, 15 minutes, sustain a couple of drives, get yourself into the game. But for me, it starts offensively. Is find a way to get back to your game offensively. Well, and Justin was just mentioning a moment ago, you know, talking about it offensively. Ron, uh, your key to the game today, I think I have a pretty good idea of what it's going to be. What's your key? I'm pretty sure I said something like Mo Money, Mo Problems. There like, it is. The more Mo Ibrahim gets the ball, the more problems the Gophers are going to have on this Penn State defense because they're going to just load the box. It's going to create more problems. So how do you get out of those problems? you got to find a way to spread it out. Whether you go four receivers wide and just see whatever look Penn State gives you, and then you create, you carve them up. So if you put four receivers out there or you split Brevin Span Ford out there, you're with your three receivers, Mo's in the backfield. If they are leaving eight in the box, meaning the guy covering the tight end is not walking out and he's staying in the box, like, look, I can see him from where I'm standing. You got to throw the ball to your tight end and just say, hey, make a play. Run a bubble screen with a tight end. Do some unconventional things because when you do unconventional things like Glenn Mason did, the dude threw a Hail Mary from his own 20 with two minutes left in the game, and we all were like, what in the world is wrong with this guy? I think he's going crazy, but it works. So you got to do some unconventional things when you want to beat a, a good team like this. But more money, more problems. more he gets the ball, more stuff you can have to face. Yeah, I mean, good things certainly seem to happen when Mo Ibrahim puts his hands on the football. There's no doubt about that. My key to victory, guys, very simple. Whether it's Tanner Morgan, Ethan Kelly McManus, or Cole Kramer, this team needs a solid quarterback performance. We haven't seen that in the past two games, and this team desperately needs a steady quarterback presence. Do not turn the ball over, make the right reads, and keep the change moving. It is imperative in today's game to convert on third down and keep this crowd out of it as often as possible. Solid quarterback play is my key to victory tonight. All right, before we get you to the matchup meter, we want to tell you to download the Fox Bet Super 6 app for your chance at winning $25,000. Fox Bet Super 6 is a free-to-play contest where you pick the winners and margins of victory of six marquee matchups. If you get all six right in the college football contest, you have a shot at winning the $25,000 jackpot. Open the app and make your picks before Saturday's games kick off. All right. It is time now. Everybody waits for it I'm, every single week. I'm trying week. to download the app, though. Are you, are you trying that, to? I need that $25,000. I, I don't know if you're eligible, though. I need that $25,000. You, you're employed by I mean, Well, that, that makes sense. I got two daughters. I oh, need it. You need it more than I do. I was about to make my picks, but you're right. I'm going to let Ron have, have a better shot at it as well. Let's get to Ron's matchup meter now. Ron, Minnesota and Penn State. Let's start on that offensive side of the ball. Who do you got? Well, offensively, neither like quarterback is doing anything great as of late, but I'm going to go with Penn State for the simple fact of I don't know if Tanner Morgan is going to play, so I'm going to lean towards Penn State on this one. They do have a, a one-two punch with the running game. They do have a, a decent receiver. Sean Cliff Clifford's not bad. He's thrown nine touchdowns, two interceptions. So i got to go there. Defense, though, Gophers are still one of the top defenses in the country. Even though they've lost these games, they haven't gotten blown out. It hasn't been, a, 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 as JG would say, a boat race. They haven't gotten boat raced out of the stadium, so i got to go there. I'm going to go Coach Franklin just for the simple fact of he's at home. When you're at home, you're a little bit more comfortable. You know how to control this crowd. You know what you're dealing with. P.J. Flex going to have to figure it out. So in this matchup, I'm going to give it to Coach Franklin. And the fact that Key and Peel, I forgot which one, loves to look like Coach Franklin and run out. I mean, I think that's just the funniest thing I've ever seen. And then my X Factor, though, I'm going to go with an unconventional X Factor. My X Factor today is John Michael Schmidt. Why? The center is the best player on the field. He's the best player, best center in the country. But this is the key. When you're in a loud stadium like this, the center has to keep the quarterback under control. If he has, especially if he's one of these other guys underneath him, he's got to keep them under control. He's got to help them out and pick out the mic. He's got to keep the offensive line together and say, hey, hey, this is who we're doubling. This is who we're blocking. I got this guy. He is going to have a tough task today because like PJ said, we're not going to be able to hear. So hand signals, whatever little deals they did, it's John Michael Schmidt's day. And if it's a running day, 
He's got to have some pancakes. I know I love pancakes for breakfast. Let's get a bunch tonight. Who doesn't love dinner for breakfast? I love breakfast, sorry, breakfast for dinner. <laughs> I love breakfast for dinner. I know JG will take a steak for breakfast, though. But give me some pancakes tonight. You know, guys, I've been uh, in this business for about 20 years. And, uh, you know, it, there are times when I think to myself, you know, I, I've seen it all. Last night at the Timberwolves game, I saw seven foot two Rudy Gobert set a pick and roll for seven foot Carl Anthony Towns <laughs> with the game on the line. And then today I hear Ron Johnson say that John Michael Schmitz, the center, is the X factor yeah. for today. Justin, uh, did I just not get enough sleep? I don't know what was, what's happening here in the wide world of sports. Things have gone crazy. Yeah, I think Ron maybe didn't get enough sleep. That's what I, I worry about when he starts talking about non-skill position players. <laughs> Even acknowledging that they exist is an amazing sign of growth for Ron. Punter, I think that's a good lesson. Go punter. <laughs> well, we know that. We know you'd need some help on identifying the punters uh, and, or kickers or long snappers. Thing. Ron mentioned pancakes. So uh, oh, during yeah. one of the breaks here, we were offered. There's a waffle bar um, just a couple of rows down where uh, Goody and I are going to go right after this. Apparently, we were basically demanded that we go over to this waffle bar. Um, there's three RVs in a U shape where it's waffles for everybody, apparently. So that's what we're going to do. JMS should have set the camera Ron, up over there. We're going to get the some waffle waffles. Bar. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could have yeah, put that yeah. on TV. Trust yeah. me. Well, part of the reason part of the reason I don't think we did is because they wanted the camera over there too much. They were too <laughs> frontal about trying to get on TV. That Fair make, enough. You got to make them earn it a little bit. People want to do interviews. We're telling them they need to score a touchdown first. We've got a hard line here uh, outside of Beaver Stadium. But, yeah, so we might dabble in the waffle bar out here. No pancakes, but waffles. Guardsy, before we go, you mentioned uh, this is your second time in Happy Valley in 12 years. What do you remember from the first time you were out there? That the Gophers should have won the game, um, and that one big play in the second half ignited an otherwise sleepy Beaver Stadium. If you remember in 2016, kind of similar to this, Penn State had just lost to Michigan, although at that point I think they were 2-2. Two and two. James Franklin had to get the um, seal of approval and the job security pledge from their athletic director at the time. They got booed off the field at halftime. The Gophers were winning. One long pass play, an 80-yard touchdown on third down ignited the place. There was only about 80, 85,000 people there that night, but it was still one of the loudest places that I've ever been. Game goes overtime. Saquon Barkley scores on Penn State's first play, and the rest is history. But it was a great game. Uh, it was an unbelievable environment, and I expect even a more lively environment tonight, given it's going to be sold out in the whole whiteout and everything that goes along with it. Yeah, we're certainly expecting a ruckus atmosphere out at Beaver Stadium. Looks like a beautiful start to the day out in Happy Valley. We'll see if the weather holds up. I'm sure it will. By kickoff tonight, again, uh, you know, you have time to go back to sleep, take a nap real quick, get ready for tonight's game as Minnesota gets set to take on Penn State. It kicks off at 6.30. Ron will have the Vaseline ready. The Gophers will have the Vaseline ready. <laughs> Everybody's rocking and rolling as we get set for kickoff tonight between the Gophers and the Nittany Lions. Guys, enjoy the game, and we'll see you all back here next week for more on the Gopher pregame show.